I'm joined now by Dr. Lynette Neiman with the National Institutes of Health, here to talk about the new clinical practice guidelines for the treatment of Cushing syndrome. Can you talk to me about what some of the changes are? Yes, well, thanks for having us um, promote our uh, guidelines. What we have, I think, mostly done this time around that is somewhat different is to stress that it's very important not to treat people who do not have Cushing syndrome. Sometimes it's very difficult to know whether someone has it or not. And we also recognize that when one treats a patient, one should have a goal about what one is treating. What do we want to improve? By the other token, when someone has very severe Cushing's, it's very important to treat it quickly and effectively and rapidly because Cushing syndrome can be lethal, uh, generally from infection or from clots, blood clots to the lung or blood clots causing heart attacks or strokes. So that it's very important on the one hand not to treat and on the other hand to treat. So it's a, a large amount of judgment involved in, in this. So it sounds like diagnosis is critical. So diagnosis is very important. We have another guidelines on diagnosis. Um, diagnosis has been changing a little bit over the last few years and uh, you'll hear a little bit about that during other sessions in the meeting. But it we are now recognizing that more patients can have relatively mild hypercortisolism and still have Cushing syndrome and the real challenge there is to figure out who of those patients should be treated, who would benefit from treatment. That's very, that is one of the um, unresolved questions that we have now as to how to approach that group of patients. And because things are changing now, it must be challenging for the physicians and the patients themselves, and so you're trying to communicate the information about what the newest, greatest research is. Yes, so what we're trying to get across to folks is that in general, uh, one thing that hasn't changed very much is that surgery is the mainstay of treatment. Once one makes the diagnosis of Cushing's, one has to figure out the cause of Cushing's. This is generally a tumor in the pituitary gland, the adrenal glands, or someplace else in the body. And then the best way of fixing the problem is to take out the tumor. If that's not possible, or if it fails, or if the patient recurs, then there are a whole host of other possible therapies. And one of our biggest concerns is to relay to physicians and to patients that this is a choice of a second line treatment that really should be individualized to each patient so that Medical therapy may be appropriate for some patients, additional surgery, taking out the adrenal glands, radiation therapy for someone who has a pituitary cause may be the best option, but that we can't say that there's only one best option, that there are many good options, and that the patient and the physician need to work together to figure out the best thing for that patient. And for doctors who have experience in this, who've been treating patients for some time, is there any pushback on the new guidelines, them saying, you know, we know how to treat this. We have been doing it and doing it well for years. Any debate? I think there's a little bit of debate in the sense that some of the newer medications are new and so not all physicians who've had a lot of experience treating these patients have had experience with those new medicines. So trying to decide where to place them in the armamentarium, how to prioritize a medicine that may have one side effect against another medicine with a different side effect may be um, more difficult. Um, also, one of the very interesting things about um, all of the guidelines is that we try to have a global perspective. And in this particular committee, we have uh, two people from the UK and one person from France. And we try very hard to incorporate global perspectives in treatment in, in this case. And what we find is that there are regional differences in what drugs are available and also in what drugs are, um, are commonly used. So that this is an overall guideline that hopefully will help to um, maintain the availability of certain drugs in certain countries where there's a, a concern about losing that availability and also help physicians think about other options if they do lose certain drugs that are currently available. Sure, because it gives you that broader scope. Right. What do you hope the impact of the new guidelines will be, both for physicians and the patients that they're trying to help? Right. Well, one of the things that we've stressed is that it's very important to educate the patient and their family and their support structure about their disease and what they can expect. Uh, many times we'll go to the patient and say, well, you're cured now, but the patient continues to feel bad because that's the recovery process. So we're stressing that as part of this guideline, and we think that will help, if not the quality of life, at least it will help people understand that this is what's 
expected at that particular time. Um, we're, we're also trying to highlight that there are a number of areas that are unknown in terms of when does one make the diagnosis how do you treat, how early should you treat, and what should you use to make the diagnosis of recurrent Cushing syndrome. And generally that's a late night salivary cortisol, which is a relatively recently um, developed test. So I am hoping that we do better at making the diagnosis, that we do a better job of educating our patients, that we uh, do a better job of making a diagnosis of a recurrent disease when that happens, and that we get a better idea of all of the different options and choices. And actually, it's a, a good day for people who treat patients with Cushing's because of the newer options that have recently become available. Well, with your commitment and the commitment of all of those who are treating people with Cushing's out there, I'm sure it will get better. Thank oh, you so very thank much. Thank you very much. Dr. Lynette Neiman with the NIH.